Hello. Hello. A double dose. Let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we will begin our um, our discourse into bibliology again, making the case for the Bible uh, for from the Greek scriptures. So let's pray, and then we will begin. Oh Lord, thank you so much again for your word, for your truth, and the and that it is something that we we can trust, um, we can be assured of, um, knowing that um, every word. Um, is inerrant, is inspired, is without error in judgment, in focus. And uh, it is your mind on paper that we seek to understand and really not just understand, but ascertain to have your mind. Um, I pray, God, that this would be beneficial and profitable and that uh, you would be glorified overall in this. Uh, for it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, again, as customary, um, um, as if you weren't here the last hour, um, when I teach uh, at uh, the university with the students, I usually start with a question, and it kind of annoys them. Their eyes roll in the back of their head, you know, glaze. Oh my gosh, here we go. Doctor Smith's doing it again, right? But but asking questions are important, right? They're important because it stimulates the mind. You know, that if we just read things without asking questions, we kind of tend to miss little details and things like that. And it's important for us to not just read the text, but engage it while we read it, too. So the question I had on the table earlier was, what makes the Bible unique from all other books that were written? This was a question, and it, 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 it's an important question. Um, and it's something that is related to our subject of bibliology, right? Um, we, as a, as I, me personally, and we at Beth Haven, um, believe that the scriptures are, were, were written not, not just only by men, but God, through men, penned the text, right? That a group of people just didn't get together and decided it was a good idea to write about God and his character and his attributes, right? But that God, through men, revealed who he was to us, right? That all other books that are written in the world, think of all the billions and billions and billions of books that have written. You can put my books in there, right? They're written by an act or an intention of a human being's own will or desire. Okay, that's important, right? With their ideas, their concepts, which are described, they're described in all subjects, okay? In particular areas and things like that. However, the scriptures, the word of God is written by God through the means of humanity, by the act and intention of his will, his desire, his intention, his objective, which reveal his thoughts, concepts, ideas, which establish all subjects. This is why every single book or every single concept and idea that is written about ought to be tested by scripture. No one gets a pass. No one. Okay? Because the, the foundational basis of our how we view reality comes from the perspective of God and how he has revealed it to humanity. No one gets a pass. No one. Right? Again, the word Bible comes from the Latin word Biblia, meaning a large book or a collection of books. Again, there are 66 books contained in the scriptures. And again, approximately 40 men, give or take, who were the human authors that God used to pen his mind on paper. 30 authors in the Hebrew scriptures and 10 in the Greek scriptures. And of course, the languages of the word of God were written in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, of course. And we will be spending time looking at the Greek text this morning. As I mentioned, there, there are four concepts that undergird or reinforce bibliology. 
And we talked about the last hour. We have inspiration. Again, this is not a stroke or a flash of genius that a person gets and starts to write down things. This is God's mind being communicated to uh, the, the humanity's mind or the people whom God wrote through to write his mind on paper. It is the transmission of God's mind through human authors. Okay. This makes the scripture infallible. That is without error in judgment. It is not just, it's not the ideas or the concepts, right? That are infallible. It is the very words themselves. Okay. Again, there, again, as I mentioned before, there's an argument out there that says, oh, well, the ideas are inspired, but not, not the words on the page. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of mistakes there. No, 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 no. The, the, the ideas and the words themselves are without error and judgment. Inerrancy, again, has to do essentially with God. If it's associated with infallibility. If God's word is without error and judgment and evaluation, that means it is without error in its teaching, informing us of what's real. Okay. It is without error in its substance, in its wisdom. It doesn't just inform us about salvation. It also informs us about making wise decisions while we live here. That if we make decisions in accordance with God's reality, things go well for us, you know, basically. And even if things don't go well, we know that the decision that we made with the motives that we made was proper because we were informed by God's wisdom, okay? Which brings us to sufficiency. Sufficiency is also an aspect of bibliology that God has given us adequate, and I would even say complete, not necessarily exhaustive information concerning who he is, but he's given us a complete, holistic view of himself and us, too. That the scriptures, the scriptures are enough to tell us about the substance and nature of humanity, the substance and nature of God, the substance and nature of life, and how to make proper decisions while we live here, and the motivation for those decisions. It is enough. And that there's no other book that informs us about human beings than this one. And of course, God, and of course, his mind, and his will, because it comes from him, its source in him. Now, let's take a look at the Greek scriptures. The Greek scriptures consist of 27 books and can be um, essentially divided into four specific categories based on the primary subject matter they cover. Of course, the Greek scriptures cover a tons. Of, it's replete with subject matter, but there are some, some primary subject matters that are covered. First, you've got the Gospels. That is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then you've got the acts of the Holy Spirit by means of the apostles. You've got that, which is uh, going on on Wednesday nights. Then you have the epistles, the apostles and other authors. And then you have, of course, the revelation of Christ, which is John. Right? Let's establish the inspiration of the scriptures concerning our subject of bibliology from the Greek text. Let's start off with the main point of the nature of Jesus. If God is the one, is the means by which the writings of scripture have come to be, well, then that means we need to focus on Jesus because the Hebrew scriptures has Jesus talking an awful lot. And the apostles also references Jesus's words an awful lot. They do that all the time, right? So we got to talk about the nature of Jesus. What makes Jesus so special? Well, it's not that Jesus is some guru that came out of the wilderness 
uh, after um, um, uh, the Burning Man, okay? He's not some uh, dude with flowers in his hair, right? And, and a peace sign that he wears across his neck. That isn't Jesus. He doesn't use uh, Vidal Sassoon either. Who is Jesus? And how is this connected with inspiration? Well, the deity of Jesus Christ, Jesus is God in human flesh, okay? He is the God of the Hebrew scriptures. There is no distinction, as mentioned, we'll mention again, first hour, gotta, 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 gotta give it, you know, there's some people that believe that God was, you know, he's just this wrathful dude in the, in the, in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. He's just, he's just, he's just a kid with the magnifying glass. Just your next fire, hell, brim smoke. Your next fire. I mean, they just they think of him like this. And then when you get to the New Testament, you know he's running with kids, he's frolicking in the morning dew, right? You know, and stuff like that. What kind of? No, no. The same God that was throwing heat rocks at uh, at Sodom and Gomorrah is the same God that's wrapped in flesh. It's the same one. The deity of Jesus Christ and the direct spoken activity of Him establishes the inspiration of scripture. When Jesus is speaking, God is speaking, period, okay? And the authors, of course, record the words of Jesus. We have to establish this. In John chapter one, verses one to three, again, we read the following. In the beginning was the word. Again, I believe it's referring back to Hebrew scriptures concerning the deity of Jesus. And the word was with God, and God was this word. The word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being, that existed. So right from the jump, John, in his epistle, in his gospel, underscores the nature and character of Jesus. He is God, period. God in human flesh. And this is important because when we read forward in John chapter 1, verses 17 to 18, John gives us a couple an interesting detail here. He says, For the law was given through Moses. Well, yes, it was given through Moses. But the source was God. We talked about that in the Hebrew scriptures, right? That the finger of God wrote on the tablets that God gave to Moses. So for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. Don't, don't miss, don't skip over that. Because John doesn't suggest here, he writes pretty boldly that Jesus is again the very God of the Hebrew scriptures, who was in the bosom of the Father. He, that is Jesus, has explained him. The word explained here in the Greek is exogenomai. You should recognize this is because we get this word exegesis. This is the root where we get the word exegesis from as we seek to exegete the text, right? To draw out what the text says, right? Rather than eisegesis, read into what the text says. We try to draw that out. Jesus explains the Father to those around him. This word occurs six times in the Greek scripture. It means to declare and to tell, to tell of the Father. And of course, what Jesus communicated to his apostles, to those around him, is communicated and written for us to read and to think about and to consider. So again, the very words of Jesus themselves carry all of the elements of bibliology. Inspiration, well, God himself isn't necessarily speaking through a human author. He is the speaker, okay? Because of this and because of the nature of who he is, his words are without error, 
His judgments are without error. And of course, what he says is sufficient. We kind of see this underscore too in Matthew 28. We read the following. It says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him. What does that tell you about that? Hey, again, he wasn't just some revolutionary, right? That came to show us a higher state of consciousness while we sip tea and eat avocado toast. I love avocado, I love avocado toast, but not in that context though. When they saw him, they worshiped him. Of course, he's God. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go, again, talking about the apostles, who are still his disciples at the time, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. You, Since he has been given authority and since he is God in human flesh, he instructs the apostles to teach those who they come in contact with about all that Jesus commanded. You can't really do that if the message that someone gives has errors. You can't really do that, you know. Hey, teach uh, everything I commanded you. There's a, little, there's a couple of errors in there, but don't worry about it. We'll sort it out later. That doesn't work like that. Again, God's word is attached to his very character, his very nature. If bibliology is wrong, God's character is on the line too. Okay? That makes God out to be a liar. And that's a problem. Okay? Luke, this is kind of fun. You mentioned this. See, ya. okay. Luke twenty-four. Now that is Jesus. This is after uh, uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Here it says, now he said to them, "These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things." which were written about me. That's pretty, that's a pretty bold, that's a pretty bold statement. Hey, I can't say that. You can't say that, but he can say that. Why? Because he's God in human flesh. That's why. All the things which were written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, we'll again mention this, this underscores again, the inspiration, the infallibility, the inerrancy, the sufficiency of the Hebrew scriptures, right? But since we are underscoring this in the Greek scriptures, he's talking. So what he says is also without error and without, without error in judgment and reality. To reject Jesus is to reject God's word concerning him. Again, th this destroys the argument that the Bible is just a good moral book. Okay? It's just a book that just, you know, gives you, it's like Aesop's fables, you know, just gives you some good moral information. No, that's not true. The reason why we act and conduct ourselves the way we do is because it's sourced in God. Who, who has these very characteristics? If God is a liar, then his word can't be trusted, which means the things that we do to align ourselves to the word of God, they can't be trusted either. I'm faithful to my wife because God desires me to. But if he's a liar, what does that say about my relationship? So we need to think about these things. This is important. OK, 
can I get on my soapbox for a second? Yes, I can. This is Beth Haven. I've been teaching here for a long time. Let me get on my soapbox here. Okay. We don't do good. We don't do things just to create a good productive society. That's not what us as Bible believing believers do. We do these things because they are sourced in God, irrespective of what society does. Okay. Everyone else can have a marriage that's destructive or whatever, or they can have a great marriage because they're trying to teach their kids to do well. They want them to, they want, they, they want to be good citizens. That's not why we do these things. We do these things because they align with reality. That's why. And even if no one else does these, we will still do them. Why? Because God is the source of reality and he's given us his word that tells us and informs us about that. Off the soapbox, put it aside. I'll probably get to it later. Hebrews chapter one, verses one to three. The author of Hebrews writes this, God, after he spoke long ago in the fathers of the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Uh, again, this is affirming the Hebrew scriptures, right? In these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. God spoke in these last days in his son. That is an incredible statement, which means that everything that Jesus has communicated, that the, the authors of scripture have recorded for us, they, are, they all carry the characteristics and qualities of bibliology, all of them. Again, it can be reasoned that since Jesus is God in human flesh, Every teaching recorded. We don't have everything that Jesus said or wrote. Or, no, he didn't write anything, but everything that Jesus said. We don't have the, all of that. But what we do have is enough. Enough to know what, he, what, his, what his mind was. Every teaching recorded in the Gospels that Jesus spoke was breathed out by God through the authors. And since Jesus is God, we affirm those words to be true. So the deity of Jesus Christ, it, we have to start there. Okay, if God established the, 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 the scriptures, well, then when we look at the Greek scriptures, it's not like there's a break in between. But we start with Christ, who is indeed God in human flesh. And what he communicated by means of speaking and what's recorded here for us, we acknowledge as such. But there's more here. We've got God's direct activity through means of the apostles. Turn with me, if you uh, can, or if you will, to John chapter 15. <laughs> now, Will went through the, the upper room discourse. Excellent, excellent uh, uh, teaching and instruction there. But you, whether you know it or not, the upper room discourse also makes the case for bibliology and the inerrancy and the infallibility and the inspiration of the scriptures. Let's take a look here. In John chapter 14, just a, just a verse over, Jesus talking with his disciples before his death, informs them about their role as apostles and who is going to assist them in carrying out this task. In verses, uh, in verse, in chapter 14, um, verse, uh, actually, I'll, I'll probably start, uh, let's see, where are we going here? Um, yeah, I'll start at verse 16, but my main text is in 25, which I have, which I'll have up on the screen here. It says here, I will ask the father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you all know him because he abides with you 
and he will be in you. If you skip down to verse 25 here, it says these things, that is the things he mentioned above, I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring into, into your remembrance all that I have said to you. The context of the passage is Jesus is talking to his disciples. He, being God in human flesh, has instructed them a long time, three years, concerning his plan, concerning what's going on, and the Holy Spirit will bring into remembrance all of those things that they that they neglected to remember. They will remember them because the Holy Spirit will be there to assist them. Those things that the apostles remember were placed in here. Jesus, being God in human flesh, speaking to the apostles, underscores the activity of the Holy Spirit and his work through the apostles, which includes them writing the scriptures. Which means that these writings from Paul, from Peter, from John, did not come out of them having a great idea to write them. Jesus continues in the upper room, John 15. It says, when the helper comes, I will send you, I will send to you, whom I will send to you from the Father. That is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. This is the second time he said this. Again, the words of the apostles concerning Jesus, the Holy Spirit would help them recall this to those whom they spoke to and those whom they interacted with and even when they wrote. And you will testify, you will witness also, because you have been with me from the beginning. Again, if God is the source of all of his word, this continues, right? And it continues through the way of the apostles. In John 16, just a couple of, just a couple of verses below. He writes this, he goes, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me for he will take of mine and disclose it to you all. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he takes what is mine and discloses it to you. Again, affirming that the, uh, the activity of the Holy Spirit will be involved in helping them recall information that he's told them and will disclose things to them that they will teach others by way of speaking and by way of writing. Again, we don't have all the letters of the apostles. We don't. But what we have is, is enough. And it is inspired by God. That is the origin of these words that they pen, Because of John. And because of who God is, his very nature. Even Jesus's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, in, 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 in John chapter 17, fascinating prayer. Again, Will went through that prayer and did a wonderful job. 
Even this underscores our subject for this morning. Jesus praying in John chapter 17, verse 20, he prays for the apostles and their mission. Then he prays for the impact of that mission. In verse 20, he says this, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, that is the apostles, but for those who believe in me through their word. Amazing that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. They may believe in me. The apostles, the believers, will believe in me through their word. Through their word. This goes back to John chapter 15. This goes back to John 14. That the information they will recall is for the very purpose for those to be convinced that Jesus was who he said he was. And that includes not just the things that he spoke, the things that they spoke, but the things they wrote too. This is why in the epistles they're referring to Jesus all the time, right? They mention Jesus all the time. It's not because they're trying to be culturally counterculture. That's not what it's trying to be. It's not like they're not, they're, they're not trying to be that. They know this because of all of this. That's why. This leads to Acts chapter two, which also underscores bibliology. So we worked up to 17 Worked up to the upper room discourse, Jesus praying, which underscores again the validity of, of the apostles' word because the source of their word is God, right? Them being taught by God in human flesh, them being given information by God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit recalling to the apostles all of the things that God had instructed them. It's incredible if you think about it. Acts 2. Again, we're going through this on Wednesday nights. It says, uh, so then those who had received this word, that is uh, uh, Peter, Peter's word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls and they were continually devoting themselves to what? What's that say? The apostles' teaching. How can you devote yourself to a teaching if it's an error? How can you do that? Yeah, I know it's a lie, but no, I'm really committed to it. Let's look at the word devoting for a minute. Proskaterio is the word here, is the Greek word comes from two Greek words, pros, meaning to or towards, with, this is a preposition, and katerio, meaning to endure, to be steadfast, right? So the holy ones, really the saints, the holy ones recorded in the book of Acts endured towards or endured to the apostles' instructions. Why? Because Peter was just such a nice guy because John was just oh so relatable. Because uh, the other apostles were just so charismatic in how they spoke. No, it's because the individuals who were convinced, underst they understood that the apostles' teachings were sourced from God. That doesn't, that also includes not only what they spoke, but what they wrote to. Now, for the sake of re-racking First uh, John, you know, Will, I try to not, I try to avoid things 
you know, so that we don't cross our streams. Because you know what happens when you cross the streams, right? But in 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 the uh, in the in the wise words of Egon Spangler, we're going to cross the streams. Okay. In First John chapter one verses one to three, this is kind of cool here. Because again, this underscores the validity of the text and, and, and what the apostles, not only what they said, but what they wrote. This is from John. Who wrote this? What does John start off with in 1 John? He starts off by talking about his relationship with Christ and who he is, what was from the beginning. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, what we touch with our hands concerning the word of life. And that life was manifested. And we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you all, to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. He's writing this. Okay. So that you may have fellowship with us. Will's been talking about this all the time. That those who go away from the teaching of the apostles do not have fellowship with the apostles. That tells you something about the nature of God's word. That it can be trusted. Why? Because it is sourced in the apostles who got it directly from God himself, which underscores this one. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We were with him. We heard what he said. You can trust this. And it's not just in what they said, because they said a lot of things, but it's also in what they wrote. Too. So, the deity of Jesus Christ and his spoken activity establishes the inspiration and all of the other qualities found in Scripture. And God's direct activity by means of the apostles also underscores the inspiration and all of the qualities found in this topic of bibliology, all of it. But there's still a little more, though. How about this one? So God's direct spoken activity by the apostles was also affirmed by the other by other apostles. Ain't that something? So not only was it uh, uh, influenced personally by the apostles through them, but they also affirm that they're telling the truth. How do we know this? Second Peter chapter three gives us this, this uh, information. Chapter three, verses 14 to 16. It says this, therefore beloved, since you look for these things, that is the things he was talking about in, a, uh, in the above information in the context of the passage, be diligent to be found by him in peace, um, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, uh, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom, whenever you see this word here, this isn't talking about, you know, he just, he just read a book, got some good points and noted them. This, when you talk about the wisdom, there's only one, there's only one wisdom. There's only one source here. Okay. The wisdom given to him. He didn't, he, he didn't, it's not like he sat down and went, you know what? I think I'm going to write something wise and I think I'll be all right. No. This was given to him, wrote to you also in all of his letters, 
Wow, we don't have all the letters of Paul, but we do have some letters of Paul, and that's included in, all, in that all there. Okay, so 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Romans, all of those are included in that letter. They inform us of the wisdom given to him. First and second Thessalonians. That's why they throw Philemon in there, right? Because all of his letters have some wisdom. That's kind of the idea. Okay. So the wisdom given to him, which wrote to you, so also in all of his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and able distort as they do the rest of the scriptures. What a statement. That means that Peter basically says that Paul's letters are scripture. That the untaught and unstable pervert, they twist. They distort, which is a problem. What a statement. So that means that the apostles, what they said was inspired by God. We don't know all of the discussions that they had. The letters that they wrote, we don't have all the letters, but the things that we do have tell us of the wisdom. All of them. That's pretty neat. And they are regarded as scriptures, sacred texts. How about this one? The affirmation of God's direct activity through the means of the apostles testified to others. So we have apostolic authors who affirm the validity of what they wrote. We have Jesus who essentially his words are inspiration in and of themselves. They underscore uh, divine revelation given to humanity. And of course, the authors pin that. But there are non-apostolic authors too who affirm these things. For example, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. The author of Hebrews writes this. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the words spoken through angels proved unalterable, I would say messengers, messengers proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now, this part, this statement is actually kind of cool. I think there's, there's something going on here. It says, after it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. What does that tell you? That tells you that the author of Hebrews probably heard Christ. Okay? Because it was confirmed by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. So the author of Hebrews heard, heard uh, uh, it was spoken through the Lord. It was confirmed by those who heard. So you have the Lord who spoke. It was confirmed by those who heard and God testifying with them. That is the apostles. Both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit. The active activity of the apostles affirmed the message that God's word was true. Again, this has everything to do with the apostles, which is kind of cool. And then we have, lastly, Jesus' direct spoken activity to the apostles after his ascension, after he's gone. We can uh, talk about... Uh, um, uh, Paul's uh, uh, um, appearance of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. We can do that. But that was more Paul's experience than anything else. But what do I mean by that? 
the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was given to John after Jesus' ascension. Okay. God, in the God by way of Jesus, appeared to John. He, John writes this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. Remember, revelation was written in Greek, and we are looking at the examination of the validity of God's word from the Greek scriptures. John did not think of this book. John was given this book. You write this. You pen this. He sent and communicated it by his messenger, his angel, to his bond servant, John. Right? That's verse 1. Now, turn with me to Revelation 22. We will close out with this. This is kind of fun. What sort of what sort of consequence in any book that you've written is this is this appeal made here? This is a, this is kind of an interesting phrase here that one. Uh, I'll just go ahead and read it and then I'll make some observations here. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them. God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Why would he have to make such a such a warning concerning the book of Revelation? Why would he do that? And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. Why would God have such a warning? Because, as I mentioned before, his word is deeply connected to his very character. If you add something or take away something, these are unbelievers, by the way. If you want to know more about that, just go back and to the 150 teachings of Revelation that we did. I know. Um, but his word is attached to his very character, his very nature, right? If, you add, if a person adds to them, purposefully adding to them, with the sole purpose of saying that God did this or God said this when he didn't say this, that's a problem. Or taking away something from the words of this book. There is a consequence for that because you are messing with God's word when a person does that. It's a very important. Again, it shows that scripture is inerrant. And to make it errant is a problem. So to, to, to sum up, like the Hebrew scriptures, the Greek scriptures establish all the qualities that undergird the study and the qualities of bibliology, right? Um, as I mentioned before, bibliology is not just a study of the Bible. Um, I would say that bibliology is the study of the Bible concerning the philosophy of reality as God has established it. And God's character is on the line concerning the information that he's given to us. The scriptures carry the authority and all the other qualities found in bibliology due to the divine author. This is why we can trust the Hebrew scriptures, the Greek scriptures. We can trust them. We can verify them. However, there's still a problem, though. Not a problem with the scriptures. But Willa mentioned this earlier. How do we read it? And how do we know that the conclusions that we're coming to are indeed the right ones? 
the right ones concerning scripture. How do we do that? Do we just make up a model? Do we make up a technique, a methodology? How do we know that our methodology is consistent to what the Bible teaches? Well, in order for us to do that, we have to establish a method that comes from scripture. God has to give us the method to read this, right? Not that we're talking about Bible codes, okay? And, 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 and things like that, let's not go too far. But we have to come, God has to provide the way for us to read this, okay? So what is that way? That we will talk about tomorrow or tomorrow, no, next Sunday. That's a tomorrow. People will be showing up. Wait, I thought he was going to talk about this tomorrow. Okay. We will talk about that next Sunday, the method of how to read the scriptures and how it comes from scripture. It's very, very important. Okay, let me pray, and then we will be dismissed. Um, Lord, I just, I, the only thing I have to say is thank you. Um, thank you for your word and the preservation of it. That we can know your mind. We can know what reality is. We can know how to act and respond in various situations. Um, we can have consistency and intentionality um, in our motivations and our activity and our thinking because you have given us all the information we need to concern how to um, assess and evaluate things. Um, it's just a matter of us um, not just reading the text, but engaging it, um, walking through it. Uh, I pray for all of us um, that we would understand, and hopefully this encourages everyone, that we can trust the scriptures because the scriptures affirms itself. Based upon um, Moses and Abraham and and the apostles and even non-apostolic authors who um, detailed the history of the apostles and their work and, and the activity that solidified all of this. I, I thank you so much for this. Um, and uh, I thank you that we, I pray, God, that we would continue to be focused on that. For it's in your son's name.